Well, I want to I want to go and look at a, a familiar passage of of scripture. Um, did you want to preach? All right, I'd let you. Mike is passing the mic. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Anybody else got a testimony tonight while we're on the subject? Yes, sir. Bring yourself hither. Henceforth and forevermore, come here. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I'm Kyle. Uh, my testimony is God's good. Amen. Yeah. And, and the Word is good. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to just keep it... Sure. I, I had it until I got up here. I'm like, I saw everybody looking at me. And like, I don't have it. But God is good. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I, I, I had it. Where'd, uh, where'd it go? Oh, I feel your pain, brother. I know what you mean. <laughs> I had it too. I don't know where it went. I have to write mine down or I'll lose every bit of it. Oh, Lord Jesus. Here we go. It don't pick up there. That ain't okay. the idea. Um, I would just like to thank the Lord for even the little things, but it wasn't real little, but Jim had had his esophagus burned out, and then five days later, he was getting 10 teeth pulled out. And so we were in the parking lot before he went in, and I said, wait, let's pray. And so I prayed, and I said, God, remove the pain that may... Try to come, remove it from him, Lord. And he came out, and he was doing so good. And the next day he was doing good. The only problems he's had is holding his dentures in. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, the, he has no excuse. He has no excuse for that because I told him if he had just come by the house... Me and Mike could fix him up. I'm just telling you, we've got some adhesive. It's called PL400. It's subfloor adhesive. And I promise you, if we glued them dentures in there, them babies would not come out. Well, I just want to give the Lord praise because uh, me and my wife have been going through a lot. Yes. But there's nobody. Hmm. Like the God I serve. Come on now. Because no matter how dark things are, no matter how much depression tries to come at you, no matter how much the devil attacks you, come on. you can turn around and say, devil, whatever you're saying is a lie, and I can praise God because every bad thing that you say is not going to happen because you're a liar, and so I'm going to praise just the opposite. Amen. And God anchors within your heart the knowledge to know that it's just temporal. Yeah. Yeah, this too shall pass. Amen. Anybody else before we, before we carry on here? Because your, <laughs> your testimonies are greater than, than what I would have to say because your, your, your testimonies come from within. They, they, they come from within. And, but I want to, I wanna, this being the, the Thanksgiving season and those kinds of things, and, and just because for some reason the Lord won't let me get away from this passage of Scripture that we have been in uh, last week, this morning, and we're going to look at it again tonight. But I, I, there's, there's sometimes there's just so much information to get out in, in, in one setting. So I want to go back to the epistle of John, 1 John chapter 1, just the same place where we were this morning. I want to go back there and I want to look at some other things that are wrapped up in, in that passage of scripture that you just can't bring it all out. God's word is living and is powerful and it's sharper, the Bible says, than any two-edged sword. And so tonight I, I, I want to look at another thing. My message title is Share and Share Alike because this passage of scripture in verses 3 and 4 it talks about it talks about fellowship, and that's what's going to be happening around the tables, amen? It, it's what's happening in this, in this sanctuary here tonight is fellowship. Kathy gave specific instruction from the piano. Just turn around and shake somebody's hand in lieu of family time. 
We can't help ourselves. We cannot help ourselves. We have got to go and, 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 and see somebody. Grab, we got to grab some, And it, I, I just, inside, I just chuckled at Casey because he got up and he snuck out. He went around there and he was shaking hands with those guys in the back. And I thought, we can't contain these people. We can't, listen, in, in so many ways, in so many ways, we can't stop fellowship from happening in this place. I mean, and it's, and it's a great thing because we, we all get concerned about that clock on the wall. We know we got to get through this. We got to, uh, we want to keep worship short. We, we want to keep the message because people, it's cold and we want to get home before it's too, but God says, no, I want my people to just be my people. I want my people to hug one another and tell them how much they love me and all that. And, and, and so if fellowship is what I want to talk a little bit about here tonight. And, and in the passage that we looked at this morning, uh, there's, there's all kinds of stuff in there for just one sermon. So turn to verse three and four uh, of, of of first john chapter one first john chapter one tonight would you when you get first john chapter one and verse three are you there all right buddy good job first john listen man he got him a brand spanking new bible this morning after he got baptized and he's already trying to wear it out that is a good thing. That is a good thing. Amen. Are you there? All right, here we go, buddy. I can't see that far. I'm an old man. Are you kidding me? All right, give me that. Well, you're close. Let me help you. Let Pastor help you here just a minute. Hang on. You was in the Gospel of John. There's a John. We are, but that was the gospel, and, and we need to be in the, in the epistle of John. See, first epistle of John. That's, that's where I, we, we need to be right there, all right? Are you ready? Hang on a minute. We're going to be right there, all right? Hold your finger there. Go sit down. I'll do the preaching. All right. Get out of here. All right. <laughs> See what we started? Oh, Jesus. Ephe uh, Ephesians. I just got you in 1 John. Now I want you to go to Ephesians. Are you kidding me? 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. What does that even sound like? Eyewitness reports. It could also be, be, be seen as, as evangelism, couldn't it? It could also be seen as sharing our testimony and, 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 and planting seeds. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write that your joy may be full. So the, if, you, if you go back to verse 1 and start reading through uh, chapter, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4, there's, there's a little two-letter word that just keeps popping up. And it's the word we. It's used throughout this entire prologue and it refers at times to John and the other disciples or apostles and, and also to John and any other believers that had seen Christ in bodily form. These people had actually seen him and they had actually heard him and they had touched him and they told about it so that others may have fellowship with them and referring to the, the, the life both spiritual and eternal. Our job our mandate is to take what we know, what we've seen, what we've heard to people that have not maybe heard that. And if they have, they might need to hear it again over and over and over and bring a word of encouragement that, that God, listen, God ain't done with you. 
Amen. God's not, you're not, you've not been so bad that God can't use you or God can't save you or God can't uh, 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 fix you up. Well, you don't know how broken I am. I don't care how broken you are. If you were here this morning, you would remember that I made reference to a valley of dry bones that were bleached out, buried in the sand, and the man of God began to prophesy over that valley of dry bones, and there become, the Bible says, a, a rattling, a shaking, and a coming together of bones. Listen, it doesn't matter how bad you think you are, God can turn it all around. And because of that, and when he does that, what he's looking for from you and I is that we, would de- that we would declare what he's done to other people. Look what the, well, we used to sing a song, look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Come on and praise his name. That's what he's calling us to do. That's what uh, Thanksgiving ought to be about. It ought not be sitting around bragging about how good a job that my wife did baking a turkey or or you did baking a pie or, or whatever the case may be. It ought to be about, man, let me tell you this year what God has done in my life. Amen? We get things all messed up. <clears throat> but when the disciples were regenerated, when they were born again, when they were renewed, but listen, Matthew was a tax collector. I got news for you. Folks did not like him. They hated him. He was a robber with authority. That's really what he was. He was a robber with authority. And listen, I got news for you. People knew him. But yet, God called Listen, God does not call. God does not call the equipped. He does not call the prepared. He does not call the educated. He educates the called. He equips the called. So when the disciples were regenerated by the Holy Spirit, they actually entered into fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And having been brought into this living union, the apostles became the new initiators. They introduced this fellowship to others and they encouraged them to enter into fellowship with him. What, every time Jesus did something, or most every time, that he did something that was profound or significant, what did he tell whoever it was that he did it to? Now go away, go on about your business, but don't tell anybody. I think, personally, I think that there was something of reverse psychology going on in that moment. I think Jesus knew a little something about the human tendencies that we have. If you tell a little kid, don't touch that. Spoken by a true kid. He will touch it. That's an electric fence. Don't touch it. They'll touch it. That paint is wet. Don't touch it. What? What? I'm not telling them online. No, I'm not. (laughs) Don't do it. Don't tell them. They turn right around, they go right out, and they proclaim it. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. Maybe I ought to say, listen, what takes place in this place, don't tell nobody. (laughs) Amen? Amen? Listen, 1 John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard we declare. 
we declare unto you. And once you have experienced the exciting life that is real, you will never want to share it. Uh, you, will, you will rather want to share it with other people, just like John wanted to declare it to all the readers of the first century. Listen, if, if it's really that good of news... I mean, when somebody has a, a baby, it's posted everywhere on Facebook. I mean, you're calling people up, you're text messaging them, all that kind of stuff, because this great thing happened. The greatest thing ever has happened to the children of God. We have been born again. We have given a new lease on life. We have been given the proverbial do-over. This morning, I said this morning, I said this morning when you got up, God gave you new mercies for this day. Every morning they're new. We, we, I, I don't know, I think maybe sometimes we take stuff for granted. Do we crawl out of bed in the morning and say, God, I thank you that I got a brand new day ahead of me. My, the, your mercies are brand new today. Everything from yesterday is gone. I can't fix it. I can't do anything about it. But God, to help me to get today right. I, amen. Amen. It's, 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 a, it's true. I said this this morning, but I want to illustrate it to you in a different way. Once you've experienced this exciting life that is real, you will want to share it with other people. This, listen to this. A pastor got a phone call from an angry woman. She said, I've received a piece of religious literature from your church, she shouted, and I resent you using the mail to upset people. Well, what is so upsetting about a piece of mail from a church, the pastor asked calmly. So you know it wasn't me. You have no right to try and change my religion, the woman screamed. You have your religion and I have mine. I'm not trying to change yours when in actuality she probably was, but the pastor did not argue with her. Changing your religion or anyone else's religion is not our purpose, the pastor explained. But we have experienced a wonderful new life through faith in Christ and we want to do all that we can to share it with others. See, this pastor was on to something. They were experiencing, apparently, revival in their church, and they wanted everybody in town. They did some big, huge mailing where they mailed something to everybody in town. And this lady got her tail in a knot about it and, and was thought, well, he's trying to change. No, we just want you. That's what John is saying here. He's saying, listen, we want you to experience the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. What it's done in my life, he'll do in your life. And we're just trying to get the word out that everybody can have this. You think? Many people, including some Christians, have the idea that witnessing means wrangling or arguing over the differences in religious beliefs or sitting down and comparing churches. Our job is not to compare churches. Our job is to praise Jesus. Our job is to let our light shine. It's what John had in mind when he wrote this. He tells us that witnessing means sharing our spiritual experiences with others, both by the, by the lives that we live and by the words that we speak. So an eyewitness to Jesus' ministry, like John was, was qualified to teach the truth about him. Now listen... <clears throat> I received in the mail a few weeks ago a summons. Just the word summons sends fear down some of our spine. I got jury duty. I got jury duty. The month of December, I have jury duty. Listen, 
if I get chosen to sit on the jury, I will make decisions not based on how I feel about the, 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 uh, the defendant or, or the prosecutors or whoever it is. My, my judgment, my, my decisions, my, my, uh, my verdict, if you will, that I render can only be on the facts presented by people that were there that are eyewitnesses to what was happening. We have on the testimony of the disciples and of the apostles the eyewitness testimony. They walked with him. They talked with him. They touched him. They ate with him. They slept in the same areas that he was. They fished with him. They reclined with him. They had relationship with Jesus Christ. They knew who he was and they wrote it down so that you and I could experience the same thing. Yeah, but pastor, the Bible's been rewritten and rewritten and rewritten so many times that who knows what's right. Read the book, The Case for Christ, written by Lee Strobel. It's an amazing piece of literature. It talks about why we can trust the Bible today. It's written on the authority of the original writers. We, we, we have to understand that, that we are qualified to teach the truth about him as it lines up with God's word. As eyewitnesses. Listen, we were an eyewitness to this young man getting baptized this morning. We know that there's a change in his life. Many of you were here when some of the rest of you, of you received Jesus as Lord and Savior. We know because we were there, we saw it take place. Other people have seen me years and years ago and see me today and know that there's been a change in my life because they are eyewitnesses. You can rely on their testimony. I love what, what it says uh, See, in, in the gospel of John, see, believers today we are, are like those third and second and third generation Christians. See, the readers of, of this letter in the original context had not seen and they had not heard from Jesus themselves, but they could trust what John had written about his Savior. And today, believers are like those second and third generation Christians, though they have not personally seen, personally heard, or personally touched Jesus. They have a, the New Testament record of their eyewitness accounts, and they can trust these eyewitnesses that spoke truth about Jesus. Amen? Amen? John chapter 20 and verse 29 says, Jesus said to Thomas, he said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Because you have seen me, because your eyes have beheld me, you have seen me and you have believed. Blessed are those who have, have not seen and yet believe. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that, that's, do you know who he's talking to about? He's talking about us. He's talking about us. In this third verse again says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that, that you also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. The word fellowship is important in the vocabulary of the Christian. It, uh, it comes from the word koinonia. Koinonia. It, it simply means to have in common. A lot of churches have a koinia room. It's, it's a room where, where just the, the, the common, uh, you know, they break bread together there. Everybody, you know, it's, it's not some, you know, like a lot of places, the, the sanctuary is like, or the, 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 the platform is off limits to everybody except the worship team and the pastor. To, you know, in here, nothing's sacred. We, you know, I mean, we don't want people running amok up here, but, but a lot of places, it's, it's, it's held very sacred. It means to have in common, and as sinners, men have nothing in common with a holy God. Nothing. 
But God in his grace and his mercy sent Christ to have something in common with men. Think about that. As sinners, men have nothing in common with the holy God. But God in his grace sent Christ to have something in common with men. Christ took on himself a human body and he became a man. And then he went to the cross and he took on that body the sins of the world. And because he paid the price for your sins and mine, the way has been open for God to forgive us and, be, and help us and make us become a part of his family. See, when we trust Christ, we become, according to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. The term translated partakers in the epistle of Peter is from the same Greek word that is translated fellowship in 1 John 1, 3. Amen? It's a thrilling miracle. Jesus took on himself the nature of man that by faith we may receive the very nature of God. I like that. Let me wrap it up with this. Or start wrapping it up. <laughs> First John chapter 1 and verse 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. How many of you understand that there's a difference between joy and happiness? There's a stark difference between joy and happiness. Joy comes from internal peace. It's an internal thing that brings forth joy. Happiness, by and large, is dictated because of outside things that happen. And there's a huge difference. So... So just as the proclamation of the good news was for others to join the fellowship, John was writing these things to encourage his readers' participation in both the fellowship and in the joy that he and the other disciples were experiencing. Listen, they were tickled to death about their new relationship with Jesus. Proclamation produces fellowship. When you begin to share about the love of Jesus, it will produce fellowship. When you begin to fellowship with one another, that fellowship will in turn produce joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away either. Amen? So John was in, in many ways the caretaker of the churches and the spiritual father of many of the believers in and around Ephesus. And, and he would only be able to experience complete joy if his spiritual children were experiencing the blessings of fellowship with one another and with God. That's why it's important to me as your pastor to, to see you bringing people in. Because when you begin to bring people in, then my joy is... is it is enlarged because I finally realized that you're doing your, your part. You're a part of the family, and you're bringing other people in to be a part of the family. And that's how the church grows and multiplies, and that's how the pastor gets joy. It's one way. It's one way. <clears throat> in Galatians 5.22, joy is a fruit or a byproduct of the Holy Spirit's work in the believer's life. And joy also comes as a result of harmonious relationships among believers. One of the coolest things about this fellowship, this body, is that we seem to like one another. We seem to like one another. Not a lot of bickering and, and, and quarreling and those kinds of things taking place, in, at least the, not that I know of. And, and thank God for it. The life that is real produces joy that is real. Not some limp substitute. Jesus said the night before he was crucified in John chapter 16 and verse 22, your joy no man can take from you no man can take your joy Jesus said that 
And in John 15 and verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. How many of you know who Karl Marx is? Karl Marx wrote this. The first requisite for the people's happiness is the abolition of religion. The first requisite, in other words, the first thing required for the people's happiness is the abolition of religion. Listen, you don't have to be a, 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 a philosopher to look around our world today and see that religion is being, if not abolished, at least watered down to the point where it doesn't make a difference anyway. If it feels good, do it. If everybody else is doing it, it's okay to do it. It must be all right. Well, you can't live this kind of a lifestyle because it's against God's Word. Well, I just don't believe that it's that way. Well, I don't care what you believe. It's what God's Word says. You cannot have it both ways. Karl Marx wrote the first requisite for the people's happiness. You know why it brings happiness to the people? Because they have nothing to judge their life by. Nothing will, it, it, it's okay. That's why they've abolished all the police departments in Portland. To the best of their ability to, 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 to well, can I even say this word in church? Neuter, to neuter law enforcement, to take the strength and the power away from law enforcement so that, pe that people can't do anything anymore. I watched video after video after video on Fox News where, where people were coming up to and dumping water and throwing things and hitting police officers and all kinds of things. Listen, when we was growing up, we'd be in jail for that. They would not call and ask mom and dad if it was all right. They would slap you in cuffs and haul you off. And rightly so. There's no respect in it for, for the most part in, 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 in American society that respect is, is gone. I've run into school teachers that, that, that I had a, as a pupil in school. And I still, even though I know their name, I couldn't call them by their first name. I had to refer to them as Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so. I just couldn't do it. We lived across the street from Mr. Martin. I could not call him Tanner. I called him Mr. Martin. I was a grown adult man with kids. But when that little short Arkansas guy walked up to me, it was Mr. Martin. Because I could feel my dad whacking me in the back of that... You took your hat off in the presence of ladies. You didn't wear your hat in the building. You took your hat off. It was just etiquette that my dad was brought up with. And it was a, it was a sign of respect. The first requisite for people's happiness is the abolition, the abolishment of religion. But listen, church, let me close with this. The Apostle John wrote this, in effect, faith in Jesus Christ gives you a joy that can never be duplicated by the world. In Christ on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I might not be having a good day. I might not have everything that I want. I might have bill collectors knocking on my door. But what I have in my heart, none of them can take from me. I have a personal, intimate relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. My life is staked upon what Christ Jesus has done for me, and I will not be swayed from it. I will continue to talk about it. I will continue to preach it from the pulpit. I will continue all of my life to declare the goodness of God. Whether you like it or not, whether the world likes it or not, 
not on me. It's on them. And one day they will stand before God and give an answer. I have experienced this joy. <laughs> Man, I, I can remember, I can remember going to Eugene when I was a, a young kid. An in trouble young kid. And every police officer that I saw, I was scared of death. I, I knew every one of them was coming for me. Always looking over your shoulder. You know, I don't have to do that anymore. You know how freeing that is? I can wave at them, stick my head out the window and wave. Knowing I'm all right. My life is complete in Christ. Amen? Amen. I've experienced this joy, and I want to share it with everybody, and I want you to share it with everyone. It's the kind of joy, frankly, that's going to get your wife through what she's going through. Yes, it is. Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is so full of, of truth. It, it is truth. There, it's not just full of truth. It is truth. Lord, I reject and rebuke this idea that, that happiness is the abolition of religion. Lord, I, I'm not a religious person, but, but I, I am a relational person. And I believe in a relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I believe, God, that through that relationship, lives in Myrtle Creek, Oregon, and Douglas County are going to be changed and transformed, God, because of what you have done in lives in this area. Lord, I pray for this week. I pray, God, that as people leave here tonight, that this idea of fellowship and joy would, would just begin to resonate within us and begin to just bounce around in our brains. That we had recognized the joy that we have because I'm saved. That we had recognized the fellowship that we have with one another because we're saved. That we had recognized the need of a world that is lost without Jesus Christ and that we would begin to share our joy. That we'd begin to tell people, let me tell you how come I'm happy. It's because I got Jesus in my heart. I tried drugs, didn't work. Tried alcohol, didn't work. I tried this, it didn't work. I tried that, it didn't work. It wasn't until I surrendered to Jesus Christ that my life began to be filled with joy. And so, Father, tonight I pray that you would seal this word in our hearts. That we'd leave this place tonight, God knowing that it's because of what you have done in us that we have a hope for tomorrow. Lord, as we sit around our, our Thanksgiving tables on Thursday, Lord, I pray that we'd be mindful of the less fortunate than we are. That, God, that you would bring in the homeless, that you would, that you would take care of those people, Father God. You said you, you, said you, you know when a, one sparrow falls to the ground, and I know you know about the homeless, in the cold, the hungry. God, watch over them. Keep them safe. Keep them safe, Father God. I pray tonight, God, that, that maybe we'd spend a few moments at these altars. God, that we would just begin to lift our cares to you tonight. To lift one another up. To just spend some time saying, God, I just want to thank you for what you've done. And I thank you for it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to come to these altars.